Thank you, Bill. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you open them to the Gospel of John? Chapter 12 of the Gospel of John. If you're able, stand with me out of respect to the Word of God as we read it. John chapter 12, we begin reading at verse 23. <coughs> Jesus has just rode into Jerusalem, the back of the donkey, Palm Sunday. It says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn or grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, would draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. Leave your Bibles open and bow your head for a moment. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God, and we pray, as always, that you might speak to us from it this morning. And for that, we will thank you. Amen. You may be seated. A little boy was sick on Palm Sunday, and so he stayed home from church that morning with his mother. This wasn't one of those families where that if one of the kids gets sick, everybody else has to stay home from church to blow the kid's nose. So when his dad and his brother returned home from church holding palm branches, the little boy was curious and asked, why do you guys have those palm branches? I remember growing up in the Lutheran church and they always gave out a little strip of a palm branch mm -hmm. on Palm Sunday. Dad said, when Jesus came into town, everybody waved palm branches to honor him. Little boy replied, you might know it, the one Sunday I miss su at Sunday, Jesus shows up. <laughs> yeah, that's the Sunday Jesus would show up. 
You just never know when Jesus might show up at church, do you? Amen. Doesn't pay miss. <clears throat> Palm Sunday was, of course, the day that Jesus made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, right in on the back of a donkey. <clears throat> that was fulfillment of Zechariah 9 9, which said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass. By doing this, Jesus laid unmistakable claim to the fact that He was the Messiah, God's anointed one, the final Passover lamb has shown up at Jerusalem at precisely the right time and he will be inspected and scrutinized by Israel for the next four days. During these next four days, Jesus deliberately remains in Jerusalem under close observation by Israel, even as the Passover lamb is being inspected by the priests to make sure that it is without blemish. His actions in arriving show him to be a spiritual instead of a military Messiah. For the ass he rides is certainly in contrast to the usual war horse of a victorious leader. It is symbolic of lowliness, peace. Verse 17 tells us that it was Primarily the people that were witnesses to him calling Lazarus out of the grave that are following him. And they're giving witness to what they have seen. Word then spread to Jerusalem that Jesus was coming. And the crowds from the city that went out to meet this cheering group as, as it appears in Jerusalem begin to grow. It seems like a great moment for Jesus. But he knows what is ahead. When they get into the city and, and the cheering dies down, Jesus will then say the words of verse 23 to the disciples. He will say, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now you might remember that many times before throughout the Gospels, Jesus had spoke of His hour. That is a very common phrase, even in the Gospel of John. John 7.30 was a good example of, of what I meant, or what I mean. It said, Then they sought to take Him, but no man laid hands on Him, because... His hour was not yet come, it says. Again, in John 8, 20, it said, These words spake Jesus in the treasury as He taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on Him, for His hour was not yet come, it says. Now, after hearing this expression a number of times in the past. Now he finally says to the disciples, okay, the hour now is come. And that expression will persist throughout the rest of John's Gospel. The purpose of his hour is, as, as Jesus himself will tell us, that the Son of Man should be glorified. But don't you mean crucified, Jesus? Instead of glorified? The crowds got all excited because they thought glorified meant he was going to come in there as a military conqueror and 
beat up the Romans and, and set up his kingdom on the earth right then and there. But by being glorified, he meant crucified. And as strange as it may sound to us, as strange as it sounded to them, he will be glorified by being crucified. To illustrate what he meant by being glorified, he immediately gives them a short little parable, which should have been perfectly obvious to all who would hear it as to what he meant. He says to them in verse 24, except a grain or a corn of wheat, fall into the ground and die, it standeth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now I don't know how Jesus could have made it any clearer, or made any clearer allusion to, to his own death than that, his burial, his resurrection. He was telling them that only by his death would life come. But we know they didn't get it. So often we see how dense the disciples are. They don't get it. Actually, even the disciples themselves didn't get a lot of what he said until after his death and resurrection had occurred. And they had a chance to look back at it and say, Oh, that's what he meant by that. John 12, 16 says this concerning some of the events of Palm Sunday. It says, These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then re they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The light came on. They got it. But only after it had happened. <laughs> now those words about his hour didn't sink in with the disciples like I just said. But, but they do bring Jesus face to face with the grim reality of his upcoming suffering and death in just a few short days. Without any change in place or time, John records for us in verse 27 that this talk about his hour causes Jesus to stop right there and pray. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? He says. Uh, knowing his hour is now upon him, causes Jesus to be troubled. As a man facing death, this is, I suppose, only natural, I think, to be a little troubled, almost necessary. He doesn't just struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane with his hour. The struggle starts right here. Right at this moment. I believe he is tempted all week by the devil to back out. And as the conflict goes on with, within him, from this point on, he stays troubled off and on. His soul is troubled. As I'm sure any man's soul would be at the thought of his coming violent death. He... He can already feel what those spikes being driven into him are going to feel like. He can already feel what his beard being plucked out is going to feel like. He already feels the shame of what being spit upon and smacked around and, and all that he would go through will feel like. But recognizing the purpose of his coming he goes on in the remainder of the verse to say so the disciples can hear it. But it was for this cause that I came unto this hour. 
This is what I want you to get. This is what it's all been about. And right then and there, he submits to the will of God. And in his next breath, he says, Father, glorify thy name. As I read that, I thought to myself, well, if he submitted to the will of God right there, why the struggle later in the Garden of Gethsemane? When he sweats the great drops of blood and, and all that. And God seemed to show me a truth then that helped me a lot myself. I thought, how many times have I felt that I have surrendered something to the Lord? Only to feel guilty because I had to wrestle and struggle with the very same thing again down the road at another time when I thought I had it settled. Helped me tremendously that Jesus had to say more than once, Thy will be done. I hope it helps you. Thy will be done, he said, as he struggled with what was ahead. John tells us that after Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name, there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Amen. <laughs> now that I'm sure was very important for Jesus to, to hear. If you're here this morning and you are struggling with something, anything, hearing from God is a pretty important thing, isn't it? You're struggling with something. You want to know God is, is there. It is for me. Very important to hear from God. Because he struggled with a troubled soul, he is able to tell us later in John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, he will say. The troubling of his soul was designed to later cause the trouble of our own souls to cease if we would just trust in Him. Now, imagine a voice from heaven. Those that heard God's voice were aware of something unusual going on, but John tells us they didn't catch on. They heard this, but, but they didn't get it. They obviously didn't have the spiritual perception or discernment to realize this was actually God the Father speaking from heaven. Imagine. God the Father is speaking in an audible voice for any that are present to hear it, and you are there. But you don't hear what he said. You miss hearing it. I know about you, but if I was ever privileged to be in on something like that, I'd want to kick myself. If I, that went on, and, and I missed it. I didn't hear it. I'd want to kick myself. God doesn't just speak audibly every day, you know. I mean, that, that's a big deal. I was thinking, and I, I couldn't even remember what kind of gum this commercial was for. It was, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, there was a, there was a TV commercial on, and there was a, a woman on this commercial who went out on a whale-watching trip. She paid to go out on this boat to watch the whales. And as the boat heads out to sea, she excitedly proclaims to everybody around her that she's waited her whole life for this. She can't wait. 
We're going to see whales, she says. And then she starts to rummage through her purse in search of a piece of gum. Her purse, I guess, must have been like my wife's. I never can find anything in there when I'm looking for it. And as she does, several whales can be seen off the side of the boat. Any of you remember that commercial? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a number of you do. Everybody else is taking pictures. Ooh, and an on, and they're busy. And, and she finally finds her gum and, and raises her head only to discover that she missed it all. And then now the boat is now headed back to port. She was there. The whales were there. But she missed it while she was looking for her gun. I mean, talk about wanting to kick yourself. You ever feel like her? The people that witnessed this were a lot like that woman on that boat in that commercial. God is speaking audibly. And they are there to hear it. Yet John says, some of them thought it thundered. Well, some more thought it was an angel that spoke to Jesus. And it's God Almighty. Not thunder. Not an angel. If you have ever wondered why your unsaved loved one don't seem to get as excited about the spiritual things that excite you. It's because things of the Spirit are spiritually perceived. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Unless the Spirit of God dwells within you, you might not be able to discern what is going on right under your nose. Even if God is speaking audibly from heaven, you don't get it. You miss it. Some of us are very concerned about what's going on in our nation. And others that is going on like it's going to just, everything's going to go on like always. I got my paycheck and the mall's open. I don't care. Everything's just going fine. We're going to, everything will be fine. It's always going to be like this. No, it's not. Things are happening. Happening back there in junior church, sounds like too. <laughs> Things are happening and people are missing it. <laughs> Yet Jesus goes on to tell them in verse 30 that this voice came not because of me, but it came for your sakes. <coughs> it was for their sakes. Yet they still don't get it. Things really haven't changed all that much over the last 2,000 years. God still speaks, both by the voice of His Holy Spirit and by the Word of God, and yet so many men and women fail to understand it or to respond to it. They just don't get it. So Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Being lifted up is an allusion to his being lifted up on the cross. Signifying what death he should die. Verse 33 says, but it still doesn't sink in to many of them. And what's sad is that it still isn't sinking in to many today. Especially since in many places the church isn't even preaching it anymore for it to sink in. 
They even give people an opportunity for it to sink in. His death on the cross would, would literally draw countless millions in the coming centuries unto Him. But think, we say, oh, countless millions. But think of the countless billions that would miss it. And who still are missing it. Today, the cross draws all men to Jesus. The problem is all men don't accept what they're drawn to. Remember two years ago when we showed the film God's Not Dead, we actually had somebody pray through after watching it and get right with God. Remember that? Mm -hmm. For right. which we praise God. I'm sure there have been many others who watched that film, either at a church or a movie theater, and got right with God as a result of watching it. But do you know anyone else, personally, who got right from watching that film? Anybody? Know anybody else that got right from watching that film? Not a hand. I was hoping somebody might know somebody. But I don't know anybody else either that got saved other than that gal in our fellowship hall that night. It was a great film. We all said that. And I'm sure God used it to try and draw people to Himself. Yet I suspect we all know people that had gone to see it that weren't saved. There are other films like, remember when we showed Do You Believe? Nobody responded. Many people have watched that film. Anybody know anybody got saved from watching that one either? I'm sure after watching it ourselves, we know what power there was there to draw people. Yet, we don't know anybody that got saved. Here's the kicker. You may even know some folk now that have a harder heart now than they did before they watched those films. Because here's what's happened. You can't be drawn to Jesus. You can't be drawn to the cross and then say no without it beginning to harden your heart. This is what happens. If you're drawn to the cross, if you're drawn to Jesus, the Spirit of God draws you. You better respond, because if you don't respond, if you start to say no, then that light is going to begin to have a hardening effect upon your heart. That's what happens. What a tragedy. The hour when Jesus was glorified on the cross has come and went. This is the hour to accept what He did there and to be saved. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I challenge you this morning, how will you respond? Hebrews 2.3 says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? We had better respond if God draws us. Pat comes to the piano for a moment. I want you to stand and I want you to bow your head for just a moment. <coughs> We're not going to sing an actual song where we sing this morning. But as she played, 
with your head bowed, your eyes closed for just a moment before we go from this place. If God has spoke to your heart, don't be like those people that day that thought it thundered. Don't be like the woman on the whale ship that missed it while she fumbled around for something that was not important. God has spoken to your heart in this morning's service or in the past week or in the past month. I would just encourage you to respond. You know, there's no one in this world that I believe is entitled to have God speak to their heart more than once. How merciful He is and has been with many of us where He wooed us and spoke to us and drew us over weeks or even months. So I say to you this morning, I know most of you here this morning already profess to be saved and I don't challenge that. I'm glad for that. But I cannot preach like that this morning without saying there's someone here and God is speaking to your heart, attempting to draw you to the foot of the cross. Oh, my friend, I would just encourage you, don't ignore it. Don't say no. Open your heart to Him. Accept Him as your Savior. It'll be like the scales fall off of your eyes and you'll be able to see clearly, clearer than you've ever seen before. Is there anyone like that this morning? We're not going to linger long. But if there is, and if you feel something tugging at your heart this morning, that's what I'm talking about. That's the Spirit of God tugging at your heart attempting to draw you to the foot of the cross, to Jesus. Oh, if you feel that way this morning, that's why we have an altar. That's why we invite people to publicly come and repent of their sins and confess Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I would encourage you, my friend, if you're here, and that's speaking to you. Don't let this moment pass. Is there anyone like that this morning? Come right now if there is. Thank you. You've been good listeners this morning. What I can see outwardly. But yet I don't know what goes on inwardly or what went on inwardly with you. And I would simply say to you in closing, if God is speaking to your heart, oh, my friend, I pray that day will come quick where you get it straightened out, where you come to your senses, where you open your heart to Him. Before we go, is there anyone that would say to me, no one looking around, and you know I won't embarrass anyone. You know me better than that. If there's anyone that would say, Pastor, would you please pray for me that I'll listen to what God's been trying to say to my own heart? Anybody like that this morning? Just slip your hand up for a moment. I'll see it, and I will pray for you. I see that. Any others? Just slip your hand up, and I will see it, and I will promise to pray for you. Thank you. And I'm not going to tell you who it was that lifted their hand, but someone did lift their hand, and I would ask, ask all of you to have an interest in your prayers in that individual. Pray that God will continue to speak to his heart to draw him to Jesus. Let's join together in a closing word of prayer.